school has never before fully participated in this contest. Hello. 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 Good morning. How's everybody? Good. Good. Okay, my, the title of my essay was Being Little. My life revolves around this quote, size doesn't matter but what's in the heart does. By Anonymous. I'm a dwarf, and my whole life I've grown up being short. Being a dwarf has come with many struggles and weaknesses, but it doesn't stop me from being who I am. There is no one who can stop me from being who I am today. I was born with a contemplation of dwarfism, which means I'm shorter than the average human, and it take, and and it makes it harder for me to do things that others would normally do. It. There are 200 different types of dwarf, but I'm the most common type. We grow up to the height of four foot and three foot. I'm 4'3", because my dad is the average height and my mom's a little person like me. I can do anything and everything, but I just like to do it my own way. As I've grown up through the years, I have been taught not to stare, point, or judge people for the way they look. And although I have gone by this quote my whole life, others act as if they never heard of it or they just don't like to go by it. <laughs> All through elementary, middle, and the beginning of high school, I have been bullied and picked on for my size to the point where I couldn't handle it anymore. In the beginning of high school, it got to where I didn't want to go to school anymore. I began feeling unaccepted and worthless because people would think they can call me a midget, shorty, toddler, a little bit, and so on. They didn't, they didn't think I had a problem with it, but I did. I just like to be called Hannah. That's my name. I'm 16 years old. People shouldn't be calling me a toddler. <laughs> a midget is an animal or a thing that is very small for its kind. Do I look like an animal or a thing? I'm a human being. When I started high school, I was always I would always tell myself, today's going to be a good day. Just be strong and don't let anyone bring you down. But eventually, it got to me, and I just broke down in the middle of class. And I had gone to the dis discipline office and explained to the discipline teacher what was going on. Eventually, I stopped feeling worthless and unaccepted. I began to feel like myself again. And slowly stopped, and slowly people slowly, slowly, slowly stopped teasing me. I like to stand up for myself on a regular basis. For a while, I had stopped because for some other reason I was scared. But now I'm not scared. People need to think before they speak and mess with a, uh, would mess with someone's feelings. When people call me names, I ask them if they know what it means, and their answers usually no. People need to know the definition of things before they just go start calling people it. I can, I explain to them what I am and then I educate them on a kind of plagiarism. Some people are considerate and ask questions that are nice, but others are just completely rude. Just because I'm short doesn't mean I'm weak and fragile. There is any, there is nothing anyone can say to make me stop being who I am and being who I love to be. Everyone in the world is different. Everyone has something that makes them unique, and mine is being a dwarf. Living by the quote, size doesn't matter, but what's in the heart does, made my life easier. I realized that you don't have to be pretty, popular, skinny, or tall to fit in and have friends. What makes you for you is your personality and the way you act. Nobody can tell you who you really are, but the person who is inside of you. There are people in the world who may not accept me for me, but that's their problem, not mine. But um, yes, he came in and he discussed the Laws of Life contest and um, you know, being a new principal, I said, well, uh, let me think about it. Um, but two days before that, I had interviewed Miss Mandy Kane and After I finished writing my essay, like it took me a while to find something that I thought was actually going to make a difference and make people stop and think when they read my essay. So when I turned it in, Miss Kane read it over and she was like, yeah, this, this is really good. And I was like, 
okay, sure, I'll just turn it in. <laughs> so then I ended up staying after school with her and helping her sort through all of the essay entries from all the kids in our school, and that was an experience. <laughs> it took a really long time, but I got to read through a bunch of people's essays, and it was just, it was a really great experience for me to see what the contest meant to everybody differently and how like each person took the prompt and kind of transformed it in their own way to where it reflected a piece of themselves. And uh, that's what I tried to do with uh, my essay. So just a little background. Um, I volunteer uh, in Guatemala every summer and work in the orphanages with the kids there and it's, it's such an incredible experience. And this is just kind of a story about one of the times that I was down there working with these kids. So without further ado. <laughs> The air felt warm on the back of my neck as I stared out over the, over the sloping cliff face. The rocky volcano stood in fierce contrast with the crystal blue sky in front of me, an island of waters of Lake Atiquan. I took a deep breath and turned to face the oddly shaped schoolhouse that stood beside me. Inside the walls, 25 young beating hearts, most wrapped in handwoven Guatemalan fabric, were chattering boisterously in fast-paced Spanish. I knew that sometime I'd have to go inside and give these children the love, encouragement, and knowledge that I came to share with them, and something told me that that time should be now. The moment I stepped inside, excited faces turned around to greet my nervous eyes. Several other volunteers stood on the fringes of the room, mumbling to each other regarding various other tasks that remained undone or children's names that hadn't been met. I knew that I was the one who had to take the plunge. I knew that I had to be the one to initiate the conversation with one of the groups of artists in training that sat around me. I'd only been taking Spanish for a mere two years, and saying that I wasn't confident in my abilities was a severe understatement. <laughs> I think it was then that I truly discovered the fear of a language barrier. <laughs> It was the very next moment that I discovered that fear can be completely crumbled by a simple word from a simple young boy. Mira, look, called a voice from across the room. I looked up, startled, and saw that the sound was coming from a tan little boy who looked to be around six years old. He was staring at me with eager eyes and pointing towards the drawing covering his fabric bag, the activity for the day. I rushed over to the table, completely unaware that a miniature Picasso was sitting next to me. The drawings were beautiful, far beyond anything I'd seen from a child his age. Seconds later, I was swarmed by adults giving broken Spanish compliments. Que bonito, how beautiful, they proclaimed. I stepped back and let the boy receive his praise. Years later, I looked back and wonder what would have happened if I hadn't stepped back, if I hadn't seen. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw another young boy with his head hung just as low as his self-esteem, silent tears streaming down his slender face. Immediately, I felt a maternal rush through my, I felt a maternal instinct rush through my veins as I crept to the table. In mere moments, I was by his side and I reached to wipe the tears from the face of the young stranger. He didn't protest as I wiped his face dry, just as more tears began to fall from his piercing brown eyes. Quickly, I mustered up the phrase, Que pasa? What's wrong? Then he slowly began to explain, through greater, greater accumulation of tears, that he thought was, his work was ugly. And he went through and compared his project to almost every other child in the room. No me gustan los colores. I don't like the colors. Es feo. It's ugly. He spattered criticism as frequently as tears, and he shot a look to the boy across the class, still being praised for his work. It was then that my eyes began to water. I saw myself in this young boy, sitting in this class full of his peers, and all he saw was a sea of disappointment and competition. I knew that there wasn't enough Spanish words in the world to tell him how much he meant to me and how wrong he was, and I knew that I certainly didn't have them in my limited vocabulary. So I resorted to the one thing that I knew best. I smiled at him. It was the most caring smile that I'd given anybody. And I knew that a smile was the same, no matter what language you spoke. I pulled him in for a hug and whispered the two things that I'd always wanted to hear. Es perfecto. It's perfect. I whispered into his soft brown hair. It is perfect. You are perfect. Which was made possible by our club to honor me for my support of character education and the Laws of Life program over the years, and I thank you for that. It's just uh, wonderful. I couldn't ask for a greater uh, tribute, and I was especially excited this year when it's winter was from the school that our club sponsors, which was Dunwoody. And the chance of that was very small out of uh, the 45,233 essays. What was the chance of having the winner of that particular award be from our own high school? So that was, was fantastic. And this past weekend, we have gotten to know Daniel and his, his mother and his Godmother and his younger brother Jordan, who were were there, and today we've gotten to know his uh, grandparents, and uh, would like for all of them to stand if they can quit taking videos of me. For a <laughs>
hit for her in presenting uh, the award from the English department to Daniel uh, at their honors night at Dunwoody High School last night, which was quite an honor for me to do that. This is quite an amazing young man, and I think you're going to see that when he reads his uh, essay. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Um, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Daniel Hintick. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about, about the essay before I read it. Um, when I first heard about it, it was in class, and she said it was optional, so of course, I didn't want to do it. But <laughs> <laughs> Many of my peers agreed not to, so she decided to take it for a grade. <laughs> the day it was due, I had my rough draft, but everybody else had theirs typed, and I did not. So I spent my lunch time typing it in less than 20 minutes, and turned it in late, and her response in her email was, I would have gotten an A if I had turned it in on time. <laughs> <laughs> the title of my essay is Falling. Fall seven times, stand up eight. Falling down has always been a habit of mine, literally and morally. Some people will connect the words falling and failing together. I, however, appreciate the obstacles I faced in my life. For every time I fell down, I've always fed. For every time, sorry. For every time I failed, I've always managed to pick myself up. That's my definition of perseverance. Getting up one more time than you've been knocked down. This started for me at a very young age. When I was five years old, my father passed from a heart attack while visiting family in downtown Atlanta. Dealing with his death was one of the hardest and most painful times I've ever endured. For years, I felt like the sorrow and pain would never go away. Unfortunately, time wasn't slowing down. I had to realize that I couldn't keep feeling sorry for myself. I had to step up and take his place to help out my mom and my younger brother. I had to become the man of the house. From then on, I started to take on more responsibilities, anything to help my mother out. I watched over my younger brother more, doing my best to set the right example. I forced myself to mature at quite a young age. I took pride in everything I needed to do to help my family out. Years passed, but some problems were much harder to deal with. Life started to become a struggle again, especially after we moved from Canada to Atlanta, Georgia. Job hunting in a completely different environment, my mom struggled to find work. School for my brother and me wasn't enjoyable as we both struggled to connect with other kids. I started to lose courage. Football served as a savior. When I played the game, it took me to a place indescribable. I felt closer to my father again. I was never the biggest, so dominating was nearly impossible. I was knocked down over and over and over. But every time I fell, I got right up just as fast, conquering my opponents as if were they the problems I faced in my life. I applied my grind on the field to my life. Problems seemed less stressful, my mom found work, and I met a band of brothers whose bonds are unbreakable. Today I believe my struggles made me. I wouldn't be the person I am if it weren't for the problems I faced. I think that's what drives me to always get up. Nothing I face will ever compare to the struggles I endured as an earlier child. I will always get up after I fall, and I think I have a special angel up above guiding me through it all. Thank you. A college football scholarship at Lindsey Wilson College in Kentucky, where he will be starting. I can't tell you how proud we all are of you and we wish you well in the future and know with uh, your law of life being about perseverance, you will keep getting up and keep going about it. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. What's up? Oh, I know. Wait, hold it. I got a bunch of cans.